tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 1. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me for the very first episode of Season 5. It's been a journey, my friends, but the long hiatus is over, and we are back, baby! Guns blazing! You know, I want to apologize to everyone for the long wait, but... Wait, what? Season fucking four just ended last week? Oh, good God, man, I need a rest. Damn. Well, I was going to regale you with the stories of all the adventures I had since our last meeting, but since it was just a few days ago, let's just, uh... Fuck it, I'll make it quick. Woke up, picked up dog shit, mowed the lawn, cleaned the kitchen, walked the dogs, threw something in the oven, back to sleep, woke up, paid bills, therapist, crying, ill-advised online shopping, vacuuming, frozen pizza, back to sleep, woke up, just to, to, to take some variation of that, rinse and repeat. But, you came for stories, didn't you? Well, well, it just so happens I got two for you to kick off the new season, shall we? You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now... Allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Without further ado, from author T.J. Lee, I give you Honk If You're Hungry. A portly haggard clown stood opposite, 
clutching a pathetic sign from rotting cardboard with crude markers scribbled across the front. His putty-stained gloves and sour facial expression gave the whole thing an even weirder vibe. His frayed white outfit was smeared with red, black, and gray putty, some of it practically dripping off of him as he moved his body at awkward angles to accommodate the feats of the cardboard. What the fuck? Jesse and I exchanged a look of bewilderment at the absolute state of the man some twenty feet away from us in the rapidly dwindling parking lot. It was late. There had been a phenomenal concert across the street, where my ever-daring friend Jesse got a little too rowdy and had his face kicked in. We were absolutely engrossed in his hilarious wincing before the sound filled our ears, and the smell assaulted our nostrils, and our eyes felt like they needed bleaching after reaching the source. Bro, I uh, don't think you mean hungry, Jesse began, still clutching his nose and sounding almost comically congested. I think you meant honk if you're hort- Ow! I punched him hard in the ribs and refused to break eye contact with the meat clown as he gingerly twirled the sign around, the cardboard threatening to shatter like his pathetic frame at any moment. He took a step forward, the tarmac looking like it'd swallow his sad existence whole at any moment, his eyes transfixed on me and Jesse as a soft gurgle began parting his lips and working its way through the air into our ears. Huh. It carried on the wind, but it wasn't strong enough to make out. I thought maybe he was coughing as Jesse continued to bitch and moan. What the hell, Rich? He rubbed his arm dramatically, barely paying attention to the meat clown shuffling towards him. But I was. Something about him just fell... off. He started to sway from side to side, and closing that gap slowly but surely... My hair stood on end. Jesse, on the other hand, fueled by adrenaline, walked confidently towards him and held out a hand to his ear. Tell me a joke, Brother Penny, he bellowed, fully expecting laughter to break out at any moment. But it didn't. Ha, <sighs> ha, The sound became clearer. Each consonant gurgled out in a guttural drone his eyes wide and piercing amid a sea of white makeup and thick black eyeliner, a red sigil painted on both sides of his cheeks and joining down at the chin. He edged closer, gripping the sign tightly, nails digging into the cardboard. One started to peel away as it was forced in further, black, rotting flesh poking out from underneath. You'll have to speak up, my man. I gotta say, so far, your outfit is way funnier than your routine, Jesse bellowed, slapping his thigh dramatically and laughing. But when the clown kept walking close, his laughter petered away very quickly. Before I'd even had a chance to close the gap and pull Jesse away, this macabre mascot was face to face with him. Literally. I immediately walked towards them, sensing danger. But with every step came new clarity on his features, and I am ashamed to say, I slowed down when I heard him properly. Honk, was all he emitted, but it was guttural, low, elongated, like a rumbling in his diaphragm that his throat was barely able to push out beyond a croak, the last gasp of a dying soul rushing to leave a decaying corpse. His eyes were the sole thing on him that looked alert. The white paint wasn't white paint. It was sallow, malnourished skin stretched to the absolute brink over gaunt cheeks and frail limbs. His outfit's putty was covered in flies and maggots. The stench was enough to make me gag. Jesse stood, frozen in horror as the clown pressed his face directly onto his, unblinking as he continued his bizarre and unnerving cry. As I pulled Jesse back by the scruff of his neck, a sickening squelch sound followed by a snap cut the air, 
and stopped the bizarre honk. It was a portion of his nose. The gangrenous flesh was still attached to Jesse as he screamed and pulled at it, desperate to get it off of his face, though the clown seemed completely nonplussed by the issue. He simply bowed, wiped his hand, and held up the sign, walking away from us and towards a small food shack at the far end of the parking lot where the woods began. It had a few benches with some people sitting around it, and black smoke was billowing out of its chimney top, but the inside was a mixture of too far and too dark to make out. Dude, that was the grossest prank ever! This isn't YouTube! Jesse shouted after him, but clearly too frightened to pursue. He finally ripped the flesh off of his nose and stomped on it, calling it shitty putty, as he did. But as we got a little bit further away, the same sound rang out again. A guttural, almost muffled and elongated honk. The noise filled the empty parking lot, and I looked around for its source, unlocking the truck as I did so. Jesse, what the fuck you think he is? I asked, craning my neck as if somehow the weird fucker had grown wings and turned into the ultimate nightmare fuel for any sane person. A flying clown. When I turned to look back, expecting Jesse to be halfway into the car and grabbing the AUX cord so he could blast my ears with code orange, I saw him kneeling on the floor and clutching at his stomach. I'm... I'm... so... hungry. He winced, pulling at his stomach and his head shaking profusely. I thought he was having some kind of food poisoning moment and didn't know if I should move him or give him some room for the impending explosion. But before I could even move, I heard that sound again, clearer and more pronounced. Jesse was making it. I looked at him and while still clutching his stomach, his mouth hung open and the noise rang out filling my ears and giving me goosebumps. Not knowing what else to do, I helped him to his feet and started towards the truck. Come on, man, I got food at mine if that's what you need. But I... I really think you should go to a hospital. No! He pushed me away with surprising strength. It took me aback. I stared at him in shock as his face grew wild, instinctual, maddened. I need to eat. That's too far. But there's that place right there. He pointed a shaky finger to the shack that the mascot had wandered off to. That'll do. N -n -n not far. Come on. He winced again before setting off. You want to follow what could be the end result of Pennywise fucking a zombie. Dude, he just freaked you out. He freaked me out. Can't we just get food at home? If I'm honest, I was pleading more for me than him. Clowns bothered me at the best of times. But this one, being devoid of joy entirely, set me off all the more. Jesse wasn't having any of it, though. He sauntered off and spoke less and less as we got closer. The shack had a dingy sign written above it, but it must have been in another language or made up of the same symbols in the clown's cheeks because I couldn't make heads or tails of it. It was pretty sizable, and there was no car attached. Instead, it was just placed directly onto the concrete, with huge metal clamps in the corners jutting out. The cook must have been absent as the inside was pitch black, save for some swift movements from something inside. The benches had a couple of homeless people sleeping on them, but given the part of the city we live in and the late hour, I sadly wasn't surprised. That rotting stench hit me again as we got closer and I had to hold back vomit, covering my mouth and my nose with my sleeve. Oh my god, Jesse, can't you smell that? I called, 
but he was practically rushing to the table and ringing the bell. Oh, come on, man. They're obviously closed. We should... A fucking plate with a stack of discolored meat appeared before my fucking eyes. If there were a pair of hands doing the work, I did not see them. Jesse didn't even wait to pay, just left his wallet on the side and took the food to the nearest bench, gorging himself on the rancid meat and moaning. I tried to get closer, but the smell was overbearing, the assaulting stench of sweetness and putrid meat. Just, um, wait in the truck. I'll be ready as soon as I'm... <clears throat> as soon as I'm... <clears throat> oh, God. Yes. <clears throat> Jesse was drooling between bites, thick globs of saliva as he scarfed the food down, choking before continuing. I was so lightheaded at the time that I didn't think it'd be so bad if I went for a quick drive to clear my head. I nodded and rushed away from the smell as fast as I could, desperate for clear air. Turning on the AC and putting some piano music on, I tilted back the driver's seat and rested my eyes for a few minutes. I could feel my stomach protesting, every growl reminding me that while there was food nearby, I sure as hell wouldn't have it. I grabbed my stomach in protest, but it simply growled more, every twitch like a finger prodding against the flesh. The sound shifted and changed, the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. I came to before I'd opened my eyes, and I am so thankful I didn't immediately do so. I could hear the groans, the dripping of the meat, the gaudy, shambolic outfit. He was in the car. The meat clown was in the fucking car, his decaying body leering at me, making that fucking noise. That sounded like a death rattle. The sort of thing you'd hear someone say when it's their final breath before passing on. I heard a sound I couldn't place, like the sound of a wet bag being dragged along the concrete. I looked down and spied a chunk of grey sludge being pulled from his pockets, directed towards my face. I could see it undulating. I wasn't about to let him put that shit on me, so I instinctively leaned my head forward and smacked it into his. I immediately regretted my choice. I missed. A punch to the side of the temple left my ears ringing and my eyes blurred. Adrenaline was the only thing fueling me at this stage. But, as I turned to scream at him to get out, I saw his face. Wide-eyed and with a switchblade to his eyelids, he was rapidly slicing through them with remarkable precision and skill, all the while making that dreadful sound. But it was changing. He hissed as he split one eyelid free, the eye rolling in its socket. He started on the lower one as I stood frozen in fear and horror. In less than thirty seconds, both eyelids were gone, and he cut the soft stalk holding the eye in one slice before cupping it in his hands, still making that sound. He put the hand out toward me as I rapidly scooted away. I could see the eyelids and the eyes were rotted, fetid, and decayed. He persisted, pushing it towards my mouth until I had no room to move. My hand reached for the handle and all my weight fell out and back onto the concrete, my skull hitting the concrete with a thud. The next thing I knew, he was holding me down as he forced his hand down on my mouth as it filled with soft meat. He pushed hard on my jaw against my will and as it burst in my mouth, I felt my vision fade, 
and the world around me shake, his expression never changing as that sound carried me into unconsciousness. The first thing I felt when I awoke was pure disgust. I retched and tried to vomit, but it wouldn't come up. Not even when I put my fingers down my throat, as if there was nothing in my body to regurgitate. Now, I was in the driver's seat, the clock showing it had been three hours since I'd left Jesse. I couldn't taste anything in my mouth, and there seemed to be no damage to the car, so I chalked it up to a horrific nightmare. Concern overtook confusion rapidly, and I got out of the truck to find Jesse. It was still early hours, and the place looked even darker than before, but in the short time it took to reach the food truck, I could see far more people aimlessly wandering around, some on the benches and others congregating. Was there a late night craving or something? Maybe the bars had just let out and they wanted that drunken fast food experience. The rotting stench from earlier was totally gone, too. I could smell the succulent aroma of sizzling bacon, tender crispy chicken, a medium rare steak, and flavors that took me straight back to being a kid again. My dad making a barbecue on a summer's eve and playing Nintendo while I happily ate and kicked my feet. God, I wanted that feeling so badly. I couldn't help but feel hungry in that moment. You know, captured by the memory. I was so lost in the moment that I almost missed Jesse. When I snapped out of it, I saw him. All of him. He was still eating his jaw locked and ripping at the hinge, muscles still pumping, and the tongue lazily drooping over the side as gnarled hands shoved more cold meat into his gullet, the throat akin to that of a duck, and just absorbing it into his frame, not even properly chewing. But the eyes were vacant and milky, the nostrils weren't moving, and his stomach was bloated. Whatever was pushing him to continue eating had taken his soul with it. This, this was no longer Jesse. This was something else. Something horrifying. I looked around, wondering why nobody had stopped him or called for help. But when one of the women passed me, I noticed the similarities between her and the meat clown. Sallow skin sunken eyes, gaunt features, all signs of pure malnutrition and a zombified state. What the fuck was I in the middle of? The smell was overwhelming in much the opposite way from earlier, threatening to take me away into another beautiful memory and making my stomach squeeze and groan in protest. But I fought to keep focused. My shock the only thing stopping me from crying at the sight of my dead friend. Something cut the air, though. It ripped through it, and every person surrounding me perked their ears up and snapped their eyes to where Jesse sat. It sounded like someone stamping on a packet of sauce. It was squishy, and followed by a distinct pop and a wet thud. Jesse's stomach had ripped open his entrails scattering on the floor and in his lap. Immediately, the people around rushed to him, knocking me aside as they fought each other to grab the plates, scrape, or, in a truly barbaric fashion, pulling at his entrails and squeezing out pieces of digested meat to savor. I stumbled back until I bumped the counter of the truck, hitting the bell with a horrid, Honk. Snapping around, I saw the sign in clear English. Pav loves meat. Just like before, a pair of unseen hands rushed to attention as the smoke billowed, and a smell so overpowering filled my lungs that made me cry. The violence ten feet away, a distant memory 
Even the meat clown's distant, horrifying smile wasn't enough to sour my mood or my craving for that memory food again. Nothing was. There was a small package in my hands. I didn't realize I was even holding it, not until I was back in my car. Sunlight will be creeping over the horizon soon, and I've no doubt people will ask where Jesse is, but I doubt they'll ever find him. The package is a small to-go box, wrapped in foil and still hot to the touch, the smell making me smile when it wafts my way, the emotion like looking at a puppy you're taking home after losing your former best friend. The issue I'm faced with now is that in addition to the horrific hunger I can feel building in my stomach, I can look around and see people going about their early morning routine, each one of them with that same sign the meat clown was holding, all of them directed at me. Honk if you're hungry. I can't see the food truck, the people, Jesse, or anything else but the signs and the visions of better days with better food. I can only hear the honking, and I am so, so hungry. You've been listening to Honk If You're Hungry by author T.J. Lee. Ready for round two? Come to daddy. And now, Twin Magic by author T.J. Lee. storm's getting rough. Um, what does the J in your name stand for, TJ? I looked up from my position on the foot of the bed, lowering the book in my hands to stare at my twin brother, lounging back in his lazy boy chair. Mom never told you? Seems like the sort of thing she'd have had a story ready for. He shook his head, toes wiggling as he did so. Nah, she never talked about that stuff with me. Always just said you'd know. Thought for the longest time it was an inside joke. He sighed, pushing the button on his chair to push himself forward. And it just came to me, so... Thought I'd ask. Mark was a mirror image of me physically, save for my tattoos and his piercings. But emotionally, we were vastly different. The misconception so many have with twins is that we think alike, act alike and even finish each other's sentences. But that's rarely ever true. Just because there's an imprint on our DNA that allows us to look the same doesn't make us the same people. Our mom figured that out around the third year of parenting, when I would happily sit still for photographs of us dressed identically, while Mark stripped naked and peed on the dog. He was the extrovert who loved to sing, to paint beautiful landscapes and breaking of artistic men's hearts by the dozens. I was the introvert who enjoyed a good book, writing, and had the same steady girlfriend since I was 18. Still, we were best friends. How could we not be? He shared a womb with me, and was my constant companion as I was his, until we discovered there were other people to play board games and go exploring with. Even then, we never faced losing each other to new groups of outside interests. We were secure in that manner. I guess that's the reason we still live together in our mid-twenties. Mark wasn't great at holding down a job, but I loved him all the same. 
He brought an energy into the home that felt all too comforting. Hmm. Well, if she didn't tell you, I'm not gonna. I shrugged, smirking as his brow furrowed in playful frustration. The wind outside whipping against the windows and providing a far too dramatic backdrop. He pointed a finger at me, bellowing in his best Shakespearean voice. You should never withhold secrets from your womb, mate! He leaned forward, falling face first onto the floor as he did so, much to my amusement. No sooner had he done so, a thunderclap rang out, and during the brief blue flash, I could see a group of tall figures at various distances from the window, all of them staring intently at us. I leapt off the bed and shouted, Mark springing up as I did so. Jesus, what the hell was that? I took a step forward as Mark came to my side, putting a hand on my chest and staring at the window. I wouldn't, man. Let me go look, okay? He flashed a grin in my direction before taking a shaky step forward. Can't have you hogging the glory if you've seen an alien. A few tense moments pass, and as he reaches the window of our living room, he stares, shoulders heaving. Well? I press, still clutching my book in my hand. He turns back to me, sweat dripping from his forehead and his jet black hair matted as identical green eyes meet my own. Don't answer the door. Please, he mutters, the rhythmic knock of the front door perfectly on cue. I shudder. Seeing my brother, the life of any party, and a man who takes the notion of danger as seriously as a clown may take a funeral, this terrified was unnerving. It was my safety blanket and I found myself unwilling to answer the door, but unable to resist asking. Who's there? As Mark's eyes widened in horror, and he shook his head vigorously at me. From the other side of our front door, a soft scratching dragged itself from the bottom of the door frame to the tips of the corners before a more aggressive, singular thump rang out. I'm... Begging you, the small voice called. It was soft and filled with pain. You'll die in there if you don't. So please, for me, for us. It scratched again frantically. I, uh, I don't know who you are, I began. Mark pulling his hand over my face and away from the door before I could finish. You didn't see what I saw, but they are not here to help us, TJ, he whispered, his heart beating so hard it was punching me in the back. Stay away. We stood there in silence for a moment before a whimpering echoed from the door, followed by the same soft voice growing louder with every syllable. Doesn't know who I... He says he... Why doesn't he... Why don't you? How dare you? The thumping now threatened to pull the door off its hinges as the figure on the other side bellowed, a voice far removed from the pleading one just a moment ago. How could you forget me? We will find a way in! We will! We will! We will! With every affirmation, another smash on the door, another clap of lightning, and a horrifying glimpse at the figures outside, now coming closer. Mark stepped away from me to shut the curtains and ushered me to my bedroom, darting into the kitchen to get some essentials before shouting, One sec, we'll need this! The sound of rummaging and his nervous but jaunty singing of the doom song ringing out amid the thumping of the door and wind outside as he reappeared with our dad's old shotgun, barricading the door and planting himself in the beanbag by my bed, loading the gun with haste as I stood there, dumbfounded. Mark, what the hell is going on? What is with that storm outside? I pressed him. Clearly, he knew something I did not, and the rush of adrenaline was letting emotions I'd normally suppress come up. 
Mark's shameful gaze away from my eyes and back to the door only emboldened me further. It's better if you don't know for the time being, TJ. You're not ready, and I am not willing to let you go to... to them out there. He loaded the last shell and cocked the gun with authority. You hear that? The gun's loaded! Mark, answer the fucking question. Now! I stood up. Being kept out of the loop in an already confusing situation like this was too much to take. I stormed over to him and put my hand on the barrel of the gun, pointing it away from us. Put that stupid fucking thing down and talk to me! We've just gone from zero to a hundred in a matter of minutes and you will not say why! You know everything about me. Why isn't it the same way with you? I don't know about your boyfriends until you break up with them. I don't see your art until it's finished or even hear about any of your issues until they're resolved. What the hell is it with you? I lower my voice as my lip trembles, genuine pain slipping through. Why won't you share with me? Mark's eyes flash, and while avoiding contact, he mutters, I'm the older twin. Gotta protect you. You're mom's favorite. You'd never understand. The sensation that went through my chest in that moment was a mixture of fear and anger. To think he'd shut me out to this degree. Will you take your hands off of the go- Boom. The shot rang out, and it knocked both of us back. I slipped and knocked my bedside cabinet over. Pills, notes, and a bedside photograph smashing on the floor as I hit the ground with a thud. Once my eyes adjusted and the ringing in my ears faded, I looked over to see if it hurt Mark, but he was thankfully just a little twitchy, now pointing back at the door with shaky hands as I checked myself for scrapes. None. Thank God. You're a fucking idiot, Mark. I breathed, steadying myself as he looked over. Wouldn't be the fun twin if I wasn't, TJ. A slight smile flickering across his face as we both let out nervous laughter. I picked up the contents on the floor and pulled the photo out of the now broken frame. A photo of me and Mark, pulling our best wrestler poses and suits at our mom's wedding to our stepdad a year ago. I spotted some writing on the corner of the photo, not obscured by the frame, but before I could read it, a new sound greeted us that chilled me to my core. A howl that began at an ear-piercing high pitch, forcing me to cover my ears. I looked to Mark, but he didn't flinch, instead keeping his sights trained on the door and shouting something I couldn't make out over the deafening sound, the pitch lowering as it got closer to the door. The lights flickered, the wind raged, and everything felt like it was teetering on the edge. Helplessness, the overarching sensation as my world darkened. What do you want? I cried out, apropos of nothing, hoping in vain I'd get some kind of reply. In an instant, Everything fell silent. The howling quieted, and I could hear a shuffling sound behind the bedroom door as it tried the handle before a soft, older voice than before replied, We want you to come with us, where you belong, where it's safe. From the window we heard the sentiment, Where you belong, echoed. Amplified in the eerie silence, absent of violence or weather interference. Safe? What do you mean? You guys have been trying to... You can't go with them, TJ. Mark had stood up, his gun pointing at me and eyes wide, tears streaming down his face and catching in his neat beard. You would never be safe with them. You'd always be incomplete always in doubt. I am the elder twin. I have to protect you. His hands were shaking, but his aim was true. I could tell he meant what he said, and his intent was in the air. Not malicious, 
but determined. Mark, what have you done? It's not what I've done, it's what they've done! He nodded to the window and the door. They have pushed it to this point, to us being here. I knew they were coming. I was ready. I'm always prepared. They want you to go through so much pain, so much suffering, and even they don't know if you'll survive. I can't let them do that to you, TJ. They began to cry. I can't watch my better self go through such anguish. Not without me. My head throbbed. Maybe a migraine from the thunderstorm. No. It was more rapid than that. Like I had done this before. But where? Lowering my hand slowly, I sat down on the bed as Mark breathed heavily, keeping the gun trained on me. I looked around the room and tried to keep myself calm. My eyes fell on the photo of us, the writing in the corner. And then, I understood. Mark, you asked me what the J meant in my name. That Mom never told you? I looked at him. They nodded quickly. One of the few things she kept from me, yeah. I meant to ask you before, but something always came up. He sniffed, wiping his face with his sleeve. He was calming down. That was good. Well, I guess it's understandable you wouldn't know. I didn't always have it growing up. We used to share everything, didn't we? I remember when we binged Dragon Ball Z as kids. We spent summer nights building cyan pods out of blankets and communicating through walkie-talkies. I was always Vegeta, and you were always Nappa, the strong but eccentric one. Mark smiled. The howling began creeping softly back up the longer he held the gun at me. Or how he would ask Mom to cut the crusts off of my sandwich. Leave the other for you, and then switch them last minute to mess with her? We used to drive her crazy, pulling twin magic on her. You'd always cover for me if I got grounded, and it always result in her grounding us both. You never minded being with me throughout it all, and you never complained. Not once. I remember when you came out to me. We were seventeen. You were acting weird around me because Aaron Jensen had said I was his best friend, and I couldn't understand why you were so upset. But then you asked me how I felt when I looked at Macy, and I got it straight away. We sat up all night figuring out how you could get Aaron's attention the next day, and sure enough, I drew him unflatteringly and said I'd do it better if he came over for a nude portrait. We laughed, tears sliding down Mark's upturned lips as we punctuated this room of fear with a moment of pure joy. We could hear the scratching of the door becoming more panicked as the howling rose in pitch, but we kept talking. You remember when Dad died? We stood by his side and held his hand as he went. He looked at me and said I would be the storyteller his family had dreamt of. And when he looked at you, what did he say? He said I would carry the good, bad, and ugly of our family legacy with me in my art. And he sure as hell wasn't wrong. No, he wasn't. Dad was more perceptive than I think either of us realized as teens. I got to my feet, staring at the photo, gripping it far too tightly as the voice from behind the door cooed at me. That's it. You're doing so well. You'll be with us soon. I couldn't tell if it was malicious or just elated, but the scratching and knocking was becoming too fast to seem sane, or even human. Mark took a step forward as I got up, and his voice grew panicked. TJ... I will not let you go to them. I don't want to do this. I'm begging you, please. Sit down 
and I will handle this, I promise. Just... He cocked the gun again, but I carried on staring. The J wasn't always there. I added it later in life. Something happened and I had to commemorate that moment the only way I knew how. I turned and stared my twin in the face, that eager spirit long gone, the light and zest he had replaced by paranoia and psychosis. My mirror image is an emaciated mess. Tears now running down my face, I started reading as he screamed at me to stop, the lights flickering furiously. Boys, you are the light of my world and having you here on my wedding day to your stepfather was the greatest blessing I could have received. I know your father would be happy for me, and I see so much of him in both of you every single day. Theo. Jacob. I love you both more than you could ever know. You don't know it yet. You've made a mark on this world that nobody will ever forget. Mom. I took another step forward. The weather was horrific. You'd moved out a month earlier and said you needed your own space and you wouldn't tell me why or what had happened. Your messages got more sparse as time went on and I hadn't seen you in a week so I drove over after work. His face sagged, grimacing into a vile caricature of rage as he shook. The lights grew so bright before flickering again. You didn't answer your phone, and there was one light on in your flat. Your front door was locked, and my spare key wasn't working. I could hear your favorite song in the background, and I knew something was wrong. I tried knocking, but you said, I didn't know who you were. Like I don't know right now. No brother who loves me would want to go with them! He snarled, spit flying from his slack jaw, teeth melting and falling onto the floor with clumps of his skin. I took another step forward. I pushed the barrel against my chest. But I had to do this. The howling was so loud I thought my eardrums would burst. I broke the door down and you locked yourself in the bedroom with Dad's shotgun. I begged for you to come out, but... But, my stomach contracted and I felt the bile rise, but I had to do this. His face, stripped of flesh, muscle, and bone, exposed to the lights, brain matter splattering over the floor and dripping down his cheeks, as one good eye looking at me bloodshot. He couldn't speak anymore, just whimpered. I took one last step forward and held him in my arms. I took your name because I couldn't handle the idea of you being away from me. I called you Mark because what it left in those memories was a wound that I couldn't deal with. But look where that got me. I let him go, my visage of him returning to the normal, happy brother I remembered for a moment, the shotgun in my hands and the police sirens outside wailing as my mom cried against the bedroom door, begging for my life so she wouldn't have to bury her other son. I looked up at him, the version of him I wanted to remember, but knew what it would do to me if I did. The hedonistic, outgoing, considerate elder twin that had tried for so long to keep his demons at bay before succumbing to them. The ugly legacy of our family proved too much for him in his fight and inevitably manifesting in me. He smiled at me, the way I remembered him doing so. My smile. The one I hadn't seen either of us in so, so long. I put the gun down and walked towards the door. You've got a long road ahead of you if you go with them. I won't be there to help you. You know that, right? 
I don't have all the answers. He called after me, the light hitting his face just right and making him look radiant, the way I idolized him in my mind. I pulled on the handle, nodding. I know. But look on the bright side. At least now you know what the J stands for. You've been listening to Twin Magic by author T.J. Lee. T.J. Lee is a British horror writer best known for penning the creepypasta sensation The Expressionless back in 2012. A well-known name in the online horror space, he has since then released several viral short stories through the No Sleep platform and gained a cult following. He is also heavily involved in the British wrestling scene as a commentator and manager. He can be found on his Facebook page, TJ Lee Writer, or on Twitter at TJ Lee. He has been featured in The Independent, Vice, and Mashable. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks, available now on audible.com. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time, and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you support this show, and that also means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another Dance with Darkness. I bet you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. <laughs> <laughs>